it's worth uh, trying to explore. Uh, let me put it in a larger context first. So one of the most startling facts about our erotic lives, our sex lives, in the broadest sense of those lives, is that um, there is something like the idea, at least, of what Freud calls a sexual perversion. The very idea that there should be something like that, however we call it, I don't want to disparage it by, as Freud does by thinking, well, there is a hetero, heteronormative norm. That's the best kind. So, you know, penetrative uh, heterosexual sex, that's the thing we should all be trying to achieve. And if we don't achieve it, it's because we haven't developed properly uh, sexually. So, uh, gay people, uh, people who are turned on by something other than uh, sexual contact with another human being, uh, these are all, in some sense, lesser <coughs> lives. We, we find people saying, talk, saying things like, those poor people, right? <laughs> the ones who haven't made it into adulthood by achieving successful heteronormative relations. Um, nonetheless, the very fact of there being different aims, different ways in which a sex life can play itself out is one of the most startling facts about it. That's one that distinguishes our sexual desires, for example, from our hunger and thirsts, which, when they're strange, are usually so because there's a sexualized element in them. Right? So sex, our sexual desires have this um, multifaceted set of sides to it um, that are, uh, they're increasingly obvious as they different norms norms alternative to the heteronormative norms have come to play a role so that people feel far more comfortable, socially comfortable, in expressing sexual identities that are quite different from, from the ones that they would have been comfortable expressing, say, even in the 1950s. So that's one thought. Another, which is equally um, uh, uh, strange, is the existence of something like pornography. You know, you just have to sort of think, what, what are the analogs of this? What, what are they? We actually, when we encounter other kinds of things that are like them, we tend to group them together. We tend to think of violent, violent porn violence, which is, you know, being turned on, not necessarily by sexual violence, but by violence generally. So we want to think about the, the idea that there is an art form kind of creation of, of uh, literature, of films, and pictures, etc., that are, that, that are intended to have a certain kind of effect on us, and, uh, and that their role in our lives is, in fact, to have that effect. They're more, in some ways, they're more like drugs. Uh, so when you want to get sexually excited, here's uh, something that you can turn to that will sexually uh, so the French, I was thinking, talk about left-handed books. You know, those books you read while your right hand is busy doing something else, um, right? And uh, the very idea that there is such a thing, right? And that we might turn, we might want uh, kinds of books in our lives or pictures or whatever, because sometimes we need to get sexually excited, but we're, we can't or we're not in the mood. The Chinese, the ancient Chinese, had what they called pillow books, and uh, these were uh, now they're. Everybody would like to own so on. They're really quite beautiful. But a mother would give a pillow book to her daughter who was about to get married, and the pillow book would do a number of things. First, it would show a whole a bit like the Kama Sutra, right? A lot of erotic possibilities that the daughter might not know about. But it also served to stimulate uh, sexual desire in both the daughter and the husband. So the thought is, by looking at these two things together, you get turned on and ready. Uh, not necessarily to do all the things that are in the book, but uh, to do other things that are like them. And uh, I, want, I want to start with a thought. Oh, this is introduced, uh, I, I picked it up in this book by Carol Gilligan. It's Carol Gilligan, a famous uh, sociologist, that many of you may uh, know about from a different context, in which she discovered uh, that most of the ethical writing, uh, even by very prominent, ethicists and moral philosophers 
tended to take a kind of male norm as the norm for ethical development. I put this a bit like with heteronormative development. So you have a picture of what it is to go through a series of developmental stages as a sexual being. And you, if you're lucky, you come out with the right one. And the right one is that you want to have sex with somebody of the opposite sex and of sex of a reproductive kind, roughly speaking. Uh, in the ethical case, that's the, um, the way the story is told, uh, you go through a series of stages as an ethical being becoming uh, aware of, of ethical demands. And the highest one is an ethics of principle, in which now you see uh, you go beyond things like sympathy, empathy, feeling, uh, and you go to abstract principles. So you, you think not, oh, that poor person is suffering, I shall do something. You think, is it right just that I do anything about it at all? What general principle should I apply? And what Gilligan um, pointed out is that this, uh, this actually identifies as the best ethical position, a position that's most characteristically the position of males. And that women's uh, moral development, uh, while rep represented from that point of view, is less because they stay at the level of emotional responsivity as uh, better and don't abstract away from their feelings towards principles. That's a lower level. And Gilligan said, no, that's a, uh, all that you're doing is you're essentially sexualizing uh, moral development and you're, uh, you're picking the male one as the ideal one. So that was a very important um, so in a different voice was the, uh, the Perfectly Gilligan's first book, and I went, it really had a huge impact on people that I read and they were uh, quite justly famous. The second book was the one that I'm uh, talking about, I think it's less good, um, but uh, nonetheless it has some very interesting ideas in it. And partly the interesting ideas you know, are a fairly uh, clear expression of a set of thoughts that are, that permeate uh, culture. So she is, she is kind of hearing these uh, voices and then she is giving a clear expression of them. And they, they're very, it's a, it's a little narrative and this narrative is a very useful one to have in mind. Freud too thought it was a very important narrative, though he pictures it slightly differently. And it's the narrative of the difference between bringing up a little boy and and, uh, of course, one of the things we'd want to say about this is that we ought not to biologize it. And so we ought not to think that, right, you bring up a little girl this way because this is the natural way to bring her up, and you bring up a little boy because this is the natural way to bring her up, and that's good. It's rather that this is a sociocultural phenomenon, ways of parenting little boys and little girls, as a result of which the idea is you produce little boys, some little girls, or men and women as a result of socializing them in a certain way. Nonetheless, at the core of it, there's a, a little uh, node, you know, a little place that I think is well worth um, thinking about. So I'm going to just read you this little bit about Carol Gilligan and then we'll kind of reflect on it. And then I'll slip over to a different, uh, different one. This is the story, and in a way, it is a fable, like much of our thought about things. Is it? Kind of story of fiction, uh, but we invest it with far more impact than we do most of the other fictions. Uh, so this one, this fiction, is this one. When a mother and child are together, uh, Gilligan says, they fall naturally into the rhythm of relationship. They move in and out of contact, finding and losing and refinding each other. In the process, the child experiences the pleasure of moving in synchrony with another person, a pleasure that will become for her a marker, a compass, pointing to emotional true north later on. So here's the little, it's not quite the two lovers running towards one another in slow-mo with the, uh, you know, circular illumination and Mozart playing in the background. Um, it's, uh, but it is a story of, you know, harmonious uh, interplay between two uh, beings, each of whom is learning the other, uh, right, in this free, loving, affectionate, safe place. And this becomes for the, uh, for the child a kind of uh, 
sign or little uh, uh, internalized narrative for the future. This is what relationship should be like, like this one. Um, at the same time, uh, she begins to acquire the uh, child of skills, the skills of a lover, which involve being able to sense changes in those who are emotionally weaker, to tune into the rhythms and turns of another's thoughts and feelings. And it's these skills which retained and developed will enable her to enter into a confiding relationship where the sort of pleasure she experienced with her mother becomes available once again. So, right, the child's story takes on those normative, the still story about child development takes on a kind of normative world that says this is what good relationship should be like later on. In patriarchal, that's with a little girl child, in patriarchal stories like, a, like ours, a boy's fate is different. He's separated from his mother and deprived of intimacy with her much earlier. So he's less likely than a girl to retain and develop these harmonizing skills. In Gilligan's view, even Freud's Oedipus complex is best seen as just one of a number of devices employed to affect this mother-son separation. Sexualizing the intimacy, placing it under taboo, linking freedom with leaving women and going off with men, and making any woman who resists this separation a virtual jocasta. Notice the, the whole thing that the, the, the language is descriptive, but notice how balanced or normative uh, it is. Once a five-year-old boy has left his mother, therefore, he's faced with a poignant dilemma. Either he must learn to hide the tender feelings and vulnerabilities he previously revealed to her, or the other boys will bully and shame him, calling him a sissy, a mommy's boy, a faggot, a pussy. Eventually, to become one of them, he hides his feelings so well, even he can't find them. That's the, the little narrow. So this is how you produce little boys and little girls. Little boys are sent off to toughen up, right? And, uh, and moreover, they're, they're faced with a challenge, right? So notice that in the relationship between the mother and the daughter, the issue of sexuality doesn't emerge as a challenge to their bond even after puberty and so on. But with the little boy, it does, right? So at a certain point, it's not okay for mommies and sons to do the kinds of things they used to do. And boy and mom has to push away or uh, right, do this. And if not mom, then other boys and so on will do it. Don't be so tied to your mother's apron strings. Oh, what are you? Right. You have to enter into the tribe of boys. Uh, when he grows up and falls in love, what was an advantage in the schoolyard, <coughs> tough, being tough, not showing your feelings, becomes a liability at home. What should be an opening into a relationship is blocked by anxiety. If he reveals the part of himself deemed unmanly, he will sacrifice the love and intimacy he desires so intensely. He can't even listen to his wife and daughter without fearing that he will lose his manhood. You, I, I, I hope you're getting the feeling, at least I did when I was reading the book, that um, these are all pretty extreme. Uh, but uh, the, the thought is not that it always works just perfectly like that, but these are pressures, so to speak. In the, uh, and that's too bad, uh, because if Gilligan is right, they know something, the women know something, he doesn't, something that could help him get what he wants. As a result of their longer relationship with their mothers, girl more, girls more readily remember the pleasure it provided, a pleasure they miss in their marriages and other supposedly intimate relationships with men. Men are from Mars, the violent god. Women are from Venus, the loving. Consequently, they're better able to recognize the difference between <coughs> presence and absence, between love and not love, provided they trust their own intuitions and don't get cowed into doubting them. That is, provided the women hold on to their insights and don't, get, don't lose them. As patriarchy's power wanes, this trust comes more easily and is harder to undermine, so that women more and more resist the invitation to absent themselves from relationship in the name of love and the, quote, death in life existence, which comes from accepting. Now, the, the, the thought right, of settling for a relationship in which you can't express, explore your feelings because you're having it with a man who can't be in touch with his feelings because of the story that we have. If you accept <coughs> that, 
you are cutting your own <coughs> thumb. You can sort of see resonance between this story and the one about empty emotions and feelings, right? And sentimentalized ones. Well, Gilligan's picture of modern love, which is one that, again, you see in lots and lots of pop psych books, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, simple and bleak, right? Until we get rid of patriarchy, we can't have. Uh, this free emotional exchange. We can't get back to that happy Eden where the child and the mother are in a synchronous relationship and where people are sharing, sharing their you know, in touch with their feelings, developing emotionally. Uh, it's also, I think, a, a, a lopsided picture because it ignores work's decisive influence on the male and woman her stories describe. Yet love needs work to earn its living as it needs soldiers and police to protect it and must shape lovers accordingly. The world for which it must shape them, moreover, is a fiercely competitive one. But it isn't that way because men run it or because testosterone makes people aggressive. Retroviruses aren't into harmonious coexistence any more than the next door factory or the next door country or the player on the other side of the tennis nut. The traits that men have tra traditionally developed to cope with competition may not serve them well at home but this doesn't mean that others would serve them equally well at work. So what I wanted to do was to say that the endemic ill, right, that, uh, that, um, uh, that Gilligan tells us about the child, it's an idyll, it's an endemic picture, because the child doesn't have to go to work, and the mother, the mother, and so we don't see the pressures of the work world. <laughs> or the larger reality reflected in the relationship between the child and the mother, that's alienated onto, uh, so to speak, the man who goes out to earn the paycheck and whose silent support for the family is excluded from the picture. But when we include that and we say, you know, for their, so just imagine, for example, a slightly different, so the, you know, like the socioeconomic background of the story is hidden. So let's put it in. I mean, it's imagine that you're in a refugee camp and uh, the, uh, the get, just getting enough food or getting to be able to you know, get clean or uh, to be protected from violence, uh, to right, the instability just dis destroys the idyllic, idyllic communication between mother and child, right? The, there's too much anxiety and tension around, right, for that to uh, develop. Now what you see is there's a larger background, which if you don't pay attention to it, uh, you're imagining that we could do without, right? we could have it so that it's at Eden everywhere. But that's very unrealistic, right? It's very unrealistic, not, as I say, not just because men have testosterone, but, um, but also because the nature of the world as we have it, which isn't likely to change anytime soon, is one in which competition, not just with other humans, but with diseases, <laughs> right, makes it necessary for some people in our group to be able to deal with them. And that requires different traits than the ones that we... Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, um, it, it's also idealistic from the point of view that we think, oh, the woman, she wants to have the child. Uh -huh. So, and we don't take into this account that, you know, maybe the social norms make her want to have a child. Yeah, that's, yeah you're absolutely yeah. That's very good. That's a very good point. More, the more we do research on uh, women's attitude, women's, women who have had children's attitude to having had them, the more we discover that the idea that motherhood is just this wonderful thing that all women want uh, turns out to be a fabrication. As lots of women regret having had children, uh, they, right, even though they had them and brought them up and did all kinds of things and they were good mothers, but they wish they'd done something else instead. And, and of course, actually, the more we know about the relationship between um, small children and their mothers, and even fetuses and their mothers, the more we recognize how much of a, a fabrication our representation of this. The, the little embryo is not this little, you know, already kind of lovingly in harmony with its host mother <coughs> and uh, developing this stuff. Rather, it's in competition with her for all kinds of nourishment and nutrients that it will, you know, very, uh, as we'd say, very selfishly will uh, take for itself. It's not sort of into benevolent sharing with mom. It's rather thinking, of course, not thinking anything, but uh, you know, the, the picture is 
uh, the more we know about uh, actual, the truth about the development of, of, of babies, the more we realize that we have this kind of, uh, well, uh, rosy glow-like uh, picture. Of, yeah. yeah. Um, so, in the past, yeah. when I've had conversations yeah. about this sort of, like, gender dichotomy, yeah. I've been tempted to sort of make a similar argument to yeah. one that you've made yeah. that is somewhere along the lines of, yes, like, sensitivity and sympathy and yeah. compassion are good traits, but they don't work all over the place. Like, there are times where we need yeah. to be harder and tougher, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, but in conversations I've had, like, recently, I feel like I'm often met, and I think this is mm. pretty legitimate, with this, like, rebuttal that says, yeah, but we tend to think of the world as sort of like essentially competitive yeah. when it really could just be the extent of patriarchy like making it that way. There's yeah. ways in which you could see like the economic environment as it doesn't have to be essentially yeah. Yeah. competitive. Yeah. And then even in like the natural world, I think yeah. there's space to understand the environment as yeah. less like animals, like predators in, in some sense are afraid like, dangerous beasts in the wild aren't just going to necessarily go up and attack you because they're, like, manly and you have to be competitive yeah. in the face yeah. of that. Like, they could be just, like, afraid and stuff. Yeah, I agree. Well. I agree with that. So I think the, that is, we, first, we don't know, uh, right, we don't know the answer to a question like this. Are, are these things this way because patriarchy keeps them this way? Or are they themselves... Uh, things that patriarchal structures have emerged in part to cope with. So which, which comes first is not an easy question. We shouldn't get, it's like a chicken egg question. You, you don't want to go there in a conversation yes. like that's very instantly. Um, I think the, a better thing to say is this, right? The, um, uh, we're not, we wouldn't be taking, thinking about, you know, big cats and, and, uh, and uh, sort of high on the food chain priorities. Uh, we can just be thinking about diseases. Okay. And, uh, and the resources that it takes to deal with natural disasters. So forget about, forget about policemen and soldiers. Think about firemen, emergency workers, uh, the, you know. So, uh, yeah, so for example, just think about, so an epidemic starts, a major epidemic, and uh, this requires triage. So you, you can't use sympathy to settle how uh, medical goods are gonna be distributed. Everybody merits sympathy, right? So you have to adopt principles, and these principles are often themselves uh, right hard, right? So uh, here's a 75-year-old woman who's uh, suffering. Here's a two-year-old child. You allocate the resources to a two-year-old child, uh, even though both, right, mate, right? And, uh, maybe one's your mother, right? I mean, the, the point is that what we recognize is that many problems that we have to deal with in the world don't respond well, uh, like empathy, sympathy, and responding to your feelings aren't the best way to solve them. So that means even a fireman or a nurse has to be able to say, stand back, right, and adopt a, a harder line. And you know, that's very hard to do. You know, someone is uh, screaming and appealing to your feelings, and you have to say, no, that's very hard to do. And so you need the psychological resources to do it. The idea that these resources are simply the resources of males is one of the things that it seems to me is mistaken. So, right, because I think though it's true is, for various reasons, partly uh, biological um, and partly historical and socio-cultural, right, males have, because they've played the role, because they're bigger and stronger typically, uh, that have played the role in the army and other organizations, they've developed organizational skills and so forth that women have typically not done. Of course, all of this is changing and changed a lot. But that, that's part of it, right? And then the other part is that as women enter into these uh, positions and take on these roles and so forth, they too have to develop these capacities. So a mother, for example, so let's go back for the moment to this happy harmony between mom and baby. And let's just suppose that it is a happy harmony. But mom has a job, right? And at 8 o'clock, the happy harmony has to stop. 
because mom has to go to work. Right? That's, we're not now, uh, right? No matter how we think about the world, work is going to be, of some sort, is going to be done. There are going to be other demands <coughs> on the caregiver's time and, uh, and so on than simply baby's demands. And uh, as women increasingly uh, multitask and do more jobs and so forth, those demands ratchet up. So again, I think that it's, so it really is a Garden of Eden story. And I think that's very important. Very often what a story does and why it's able to capture our imagination is because of, it excludes a huge part of the distractors, right? The other factors, it pushes them out. And it narrowly focuses as if they didn't exist on these things. And it says, look at that. Isn't that great? Why can't it all be like that, right? And uh, that's fine. It can be a spur to social change, right? But it can also just be a, a, a fantasy that fails to take reality serious. So I think we could, we might just think this. Uh, even if we could manage to make the world much less com competitive and far more cooperative. By the way, the best mechanisms we have for this are market mechanisms. Uh, so that there's a, uh, I could, there's a terrific book about this. I shall. I, no, which I'm just blanking on. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it is about why markets are really good things, even though we might not like them all the time. They're ways of producing cooperation without trust. Uh, and that's very important when you're dealing with people you don't know. Right? So that's the advantage of a dollar bill, is you don't have to trust the person to honor its value. <laughs> Once they give it to you, it's yours. Money is very handy. It does a lot of really good things. And I think that we don't know the answer to how much of the good part of that we could keep and get rid of some of the bad part of it. So I think a real danger in thinking is when you think, uh, uh, when you recognize that there is something wrong with patriarchal societies, is that you, you then gender the traits that in those societies are associated with males and females. So it's as if you do a double think, right? You think. Um, this is, so here's patriarchy, and here's what women are like in patriarchy, and here's what men are like in patriarchy. Then you step out of patriarch, patriarchy as if you stepped into reality, and you say men are like this and women are like this. Right? Whereas what all you know is what men are like in patriarchy and what women are like in patriarchy. You don't know what they each would be like if there wasn't that structure. So that's the other side. You can look at patriarchal systems always from the point of view of the oppressed. But what you have to recognize is that these systems oppress both men and women. They don't just, they don't just oppress, they cast men in the role of oppressors and women in the role of oppressed, but both are exploited by a system that cuts each off from real good. So here's an obvious one. Women don't know what they want because uh, how could they develop the capacity? I'm mean, telling a bleak version of it straight. Right? Women don't know what they want because they don't know what they would want if they weren't oppressed. But men don't know what women would want if they weren't oppressed either. And so they don't know what it would be like to be in a relationship with an unoppressed woman. So men are uh, plagued by doubts about whether or not uh, they are giving women what they want. And as a result, they tend to try to coerce them into being the way they think that <laughs> they can satisfy. Pornography is the great example of this, right? So we'll get to that in a sec. So you see the double whammy. And I think that it's very important to keep that in mind, that it's liberation for men and women that we want to get when we get rid of patriarchy. Not that we'll keep men the same, but women will be liberated. It will be a liberation for both when, in fact, they can exchange, uh, they, you know, in, in which a man can know this, that what a woman tells him, she means, right? Because she's not simply worried about what will happen if she says something else because he's got the socioeconomic power. So that's, that worry can aff affect both. Right? Yeah. Is there, a, like, you know, when Plato wrote his Republic, he yeah. made an attempt to uh, escape ideology, at least in the fantasy. And so in that way, to look at, you know, how could it be without, is there any attempts like this in terms of, you know, Well, I think that if you, one of the problems about uh, what Plato's, I mean, uh, you one should never um, 
would say too much critical about Plato. Aristotle says about Plato that he was a man so great base men shouldn't even be allowed to praise him, which seems right to me. Um, uh, so Plato, Plato saw enormously far into what uh, social structures did to people. But there is a way in which uh, he succumbs to a uh, male illusion, um, which is that he thinks that the, trade, the, the things that men do, uh, fight, do philosophy, enter politics, these are the really valuable things that everybody would do if they were liberated. And so he thinks that women should be, uh, should be freed from having to be mothers, bring up children, and so forth, because, well, they, could, they really want to be men, you know, <laughs> we should just let them be men. So that's part of the worry that happened to feminism, the early phase of feminism, was the thought that, in fact, men were now free to be, the women were now free to be men. And uh, you know, women put on business suits and started to have more male you know, like, uh, attitudes and appearances, and that is like, you see, now you're liberated. And I think that the right thing to do is to think that actually uh, many of the values associated under patriarchy with women and many of those associated with men are in fact valuable for everyone. And some aren't valuable for anybody. <laughs> we should get rid of a lot of those. But we don't yet know fully which what's the list is, right? So a certain amount of affectionate capacity, tenderness, availability of feelings, capacity to talk and art, you know, or open up to another, these have become important to both men and women, because we, uh, men and women like us, want affectionate marriages, right? affectionate relationships, We're not just with other, but with each other too. Men want to too, they want disclosing open kinds of relationships far more than they used to. Uh, so there's a value associated previously with women who were always the ones who did all the sentimental work. Uh, now we, men do a lot of it too. Uh, on the other hand, there are others, other traits that nobody should have that have been associated with men. Uh, we, we'd all be better off without. Okay, so that's the, that's a way, uh, what I wanted to do was to encourage something that I think it's very easy to slip into. It's very easy to slip into kind of garden of Eden scenarios in which you don't look at the world that has to, right, su the support system for this glorious little bit of reality that you want to keep. And when you put in the support system, you realize that the, the identity picture has to be changed. Right? So we need to be able to tr simultaneously socialize people for a no whole lot of different roles and to be able to give them the, this, the, 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 uh, supple, the suppleness, the psychological suppleness to tra make graceful transitions between them. They, sometimes it's necessary to be uh, tough. And sometimes it's very important to be sensitive, uh, to be, not to be anxious, not to be worried about being defeated, to be willing to be defeated too, right? Those are all important. You can't uh, think only some of them are important. We should get rid of the other ones. Um, and this, this story, I won't go into this a little bit, but, it, but it's just as old as the Odyssey. I have Homer got it too. Uh, Odysseus has to run off to bring back Helen of Troy to support marriage and families and patriarchal society. But when he does that, he leaves his own wife and family unprotected. And moreover, he develops capacities and abilities that make him very unsuited to home life. So as soon as he comes back home, all he can do is leave again. Because, uh, you know, look, heroes don't really like just hanging out in the morning and drinking their coffee and looking at the Mediterranean, you know, they want to, right, they want to go off and kill people and stuff and win more honor and glory, right? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's part of it. It's like aging athletes who turn to fat if they don't uh, keep exercising, right? That's a liability of having been overly athletic in your youth, but uh, if you don't keep at it, uh, all that muscle starts to turn to fat again. And uh, we have to be, you know, we have to prepare for a world of life. That's well, not the one we're living when we're 30, uh, even uh, though uh, we're not free. But, uh, so, that's the, uh, that, so that's the old story, right? It was that when men have to go out and, and uh, hack and hew, uh, they develop things that make them inclined to settle uh, emotional issues in the same uh, violent way. So if you are, Right, if you're big and strong and you're used to getting what you want by simply defeating the weaker, 
Then when you run into a problem at home, whether with your children or, or your wife, uh, there is a temptation to use the same methods to settle it. A good slap will uh, take care of that, right? Uh, and then to think that you can get everything by violence when only some things can be done by violence, right? So it, that's a, a, an issue. And I think it's the one that's central to pornography. I think that what makes pornography pornographic is right, rather than all of the other good kinds of ways that things could be sexually explicit and could be used for all kinds of good purposes. There's nothing wrong with two tired people turning themselves on by looking up erotic images. If that's what it takes to uh, get in the mood, that's no, uh, it's no better or worse than having a martini or smoking some dope or whatever. You know, whatever it is, uh, it's going to make life go better, so okay, get on with it. Um, but what's wrong with pornography is that it represents something that can't be gotten by violence as if it can be gotten by violence. So the thought is that what makes the thing actually pornographic is that it's like this, right? So here's a typical pornographic scenario. It comes right, even in, in soft porn like uh, bodice rippers or uh, 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 harlequin books or whatever. It's like this, right? The woman doesn't want something. She says no, right? And uh, what the story represents, what the, the, the thing represents on this, though she says no, you can get what you want from her, and she will want it if you simply use force together. So, uh, right, the thought is you rip off her clothes, you throw her on the ground, you uh, force yourself on her, and what happens? Uh, two or three seconds typically, or so, into the scene, she's starting to like it. And then she starts screaming, yes, yes, do it to me, or some such thing as that. And then you see the story as, you see, you can get what you want uh, by doing this. You want her to enjoy it. It's not this. You're not, it's not simply this. There, is, there are forms where the whole idea is that you never want something. That's what you want. You want her not to want it, but to do it anyway. But in this case, it's one where you do want her to want it. But you think you can get that. You can get the giving of the emotional self by a forceful phallic act, so to speak. And uh, that's false. Uh, right? That's like thinking that you can get what you want at home by using the same um, uh, violent techniques that you can get what you want on the battlefield. They do work on the battlefield. They don't work in the bedroom. They don't work at home. Um, but, but it's very difficult to see that they're not working because often they can bring about compliance. Right? So the fearful wife will do right, what the desirous wife will do, but she won't do it in the same way. Right? She'll do it out of fear and so on. So I think that's a, a big part. Then I think the next part is subtle variations on that theme. So that's the kind of crude one. But the others, many of the others, are just subtle variations on the thought that you can somehow get what you want um, by utilizing skills and abilities that, in fact, are very ill-suited to you getting what you want. So let me give a, 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 a subtle, one of the subtle variations. So that this is, I, I don't know, I mean, this, this is sensitive stuff. I'm, I'm not asking you to self-reveal, so don't feel like, you know, you suddenly have to tell me, that, oh, yeah, I've done that. Uh, um, uh, it's rather, uh, if you've experienced, if you remember, um, I'm assuming, because it's got to be true, that pretty much everyone has seen a pornographic image or a pornographic film or read a pornographic story. But if you can sort of think about what the effect is like, so uh, by the one that, not the one that uh, offends you and just makes you not want to look out, but by the one that sort of turns you on a bit so that you're kind of hooked and you want to see how it's going. Your heart raises a little. Uh, you know, it's very exciting. You become sexually aroused. Um, I think when you think about that experience, um, the, the, the first thought it can have is that it, it too is a violent experience. So again, regardless of what you want, 
it's uh, going to excite you or turn you on. It's not about, it's not asking your consent, so to speak. In fact, it, you may not even know quite what you're getting into when you start watching or start. Violence can have the same, a sudden violent thing can have a similar shock value and can, you know, really knock you. You can be, you can't get it out of your mind. And I think sexual images can, or sexual uh, ideas can be like that too. And, yeah. Is this working on like a conscious level or a subconscious level in terms of like, um, what are you talking about, like yeah. violence and pornography? Yeah. Like, in terms of like when you see the person, um, yeah. like force themselves onto you. Is that, yeah. that, do you like it then kind of interpret that as like a conscious thing or? I don't, I, it's, a, it's very, de so one of the things I'm not doing, uh, just to be clear, is I'm not suggesting that if you look up pornographic images, okay. you're going to become more likely to right. do this. Okay. Uh, okay. All the evidence says that's false. Okay. Um, uh, but what's true is the, the production of the pornography and the excitement experienced as a result of it reveals something about the social structure that produces both your desirous response, your socialized subject, mm -hmm. and it's a social product uh, aimed at part of guessing. So there's, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, how would you call it? I, I want to call it a pornocopia, pornocopion. <laughs> um, there's, <laughs> right, there's a, there's a, some, somebody did research on, uh, right, all of the different uh, kinds of actions that can go into a pornographic film or story. And uh, you can select, you can think, I want to see this with that, with this, but not with that. I def that definitely turns me off. I there can't be any of that. There's got to be, and you can actually track through and find that somebody's already produced something just like that for you, right? So the thought is that the microscopic structure of our sexual responses are themselves uh, right, social products in part that are then catered to by the production of things that as a social product. So it's not that they, oh, once you see a pornographic thing, you think, I think it would go rape somebody. Um, no, it's not that. But it can be this, though. Right? It can be that uh, you, in your sexual activities, you you respond to uh, things that your lover does as if they are, uh, you know, as if they are giving evidence of something that they're not giving evidence of, mm -hmm. right? So it's not. I don't think it's that pornography makes us into rapists. Mm -hmm. It's rather that there is a subtle uh, shift backwards and forwards yeah. between our sensibilities and what we read about and what we think is happening. So if you interview young teens uh, about all of whom I've seen. Uh, lots of pornography now, the, the statistics on how much pornography you've seen by the time you were 15 or 16, uh, that's quite a bit. And uh, they think things like, oh well, it's okay to do this, right? So maybe it's anal sex or something that used to be off limits, right? You know, no, no, it's fine, and, and people think, oh, if people do this, and it's okay to do it, so if somebody wants to do it with me, I shouldn't say no, because in fact it turns out it is okay. There's, that's a case where the film is influencing uh, part of what you think it's perfectly all right to want or to do. And uh, it can be, then there can be a whole lot of other things that go along with it. It could be, you know, girls never like blah, 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 right? But it's okay, they do it anyway. Right? Um, and it's a whole subtle set of things. The causation is not kind of one, one way. Um, what the what the, the, the kind of uh, background picture I think that is useful to have is, so we think about it this way, think of money as a kind of uh, abstract form of uh, violent power. I mean, this is a little bit of a stretch, but here's a useful way to think about it. When you've got the money, you can buy whatever money can buy. So when you've got the gun, right, you can get whatever you want, Right by threatening, the the idea of the force of the two goes very uh, close. Right there, there's a close connection between thinking, I can get that because I'm big and strong. I can get that because I'm rich and powerful. The same thoughts apply, which is that you think that 
you can buy something that in fact you can't buy. Right? And then what you try to do is to turn the thing you want into something that you can buy. So let's take a very simple example. Money can't buy me love. The Beatles have told us so, and so it must be true, right? Uh, money, can't, okay. money can't buy me love. Okay, so, but I want love. And I've got a lot of money. <laughs> Right? So, you can get pretty books. Yeah, that's how it's, how it's thought of. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Uh, it's not, maybe what's true is that we need to rethink what love is so that we can buy it. So, think, so let's go back, so for a moment, think money can't buy me sex. And you, right, because, right, think of a social arrangement in which the only sex that's available is sex within marriage. You just can't get it otherwise. So, that's a world in which money can't buy you sex. Right? So what you can think of is, well, that's not a good world. Let's turn it into a world where money can buy me sex. Right? And then we said, okay, so let's uh, 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 allow for divorce. Let's produce, uh, right, a subtle variant. Let's start representing marriage as itself a form in which sex is for sale. Because uh, really what you're doing when you marry is you're um, giving sexual access to yourself in return for being supported. See, it's not really that different, is it? And uh, then we just keep, right? Then you just keep pushing it, right? So marriage and prostitution, they're really the same anyway. Uh, well, that's the kind of thought that actually goes along with this, right? To say, now you see, why don't we just have a market in it? Now, the same can happen with love, right? Because what you can do is you can start... Uh, criticizing elements of love that are the elements that seem to make it not for sale so that you can think that's a bad concept of love, that's a bad way to do loving, that's the loving that goes hand in hand with the oppression of women, with a whole lot of other things, so let's change it. Right? So the, think of, we should have a contract. So sadomasochistic picture, right, is here's what love is, you agree to do this, I, I agree to uh, do it with you. You say no to that, I say that's fine. We do this, you have safe words, we negotiate it. That's love. That's modern love. Get with it, the other kind is not worth having anyway. Look what it leads to, unhappiness, misery, blah, blah, blah. Romance, stupid stuff like that. Um, let's do this other thing instead. That's where, right, every time you think, so here's a great little thing. Everything that is free is bad. Only monetizable things are good. So let's monetize as much as we can. Oh, you thought air was free? Water was free? Oh, you look at the world. Right? Uh, Venezuela, I think, tried to monetize water. <laughs> right? You, you can't. There's. There's no free water. Well, soon it will because water will be scarce. <laughs> Clear and clear. Right. It's already the government. What, where is it in, in uh, what do you call that terribly polluted place? In, uh, Flint. Flint, Flint hmm? Michigan. Flint, Michigan. Flint, where you know they've been. They, they where like government has been giving free bottled water because you can't drink the water from the fossil. So we could go on, couldn't we? Free education is really bad. Right? Why? You need to monetize that stuff. So we need to go, just make the free stuff really bad, and then they'll pay for the better stuff. And then we can start making money out of it. What's the grounds for free stuff being bad? Just... Free stuff being bad? Yeah. You can't make mm -hmm. any money out of it. Don't you get it? Capitalism. It's a bit like, it's a bit like thinking money can't buy me love. Other thought is, I'm, uh, what I'm doing is trying to, uh, you know, by, with very simplified indicate the way that certain sorts of social structures make the world good for them by, so take, so the, the old joke in Italy was that, you know, sex was the poor man's opera. Like you couldn't, right, you, you couldn't afford, you couldn't go, afford to go to the opera, but here. <laughs> I think it's better the longer you think about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, so look, sex is, the one thing, when sex, when you, if money can't buy you sex, sex is free, right? You you give up, right? It's, it's not something that you can buy, so it, it's free, right? But if we could find a way to make it something you paid for, 
everybody wants them. Yep. So you could make a lot of money out of that. So think of it that and way. People do. And now there is a way to do it, right? So one, you can't they just say, well, no, 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 I'm going to put a meter on your genitals, and every time you have sex, there'll be a sex tax. If, if we could do that, we probably would. Right? Um, Right? But instead what you can do is you can think, if you, want, if you want to have good sex, the first thing you have to do is spend a lot of money. Why? Well, you need, right? And then you start telling stories about what, what it's really like. You, you, know, you have to look a certain way, you have to have certain kinds of clothes, you have certain kind of sex toys, you have to have certain kinds of books that you've read, certain kinds of videos, that you have certain kinds of other things. Romance is expensive. But don't worry though, there are whole industries that cater to it and all you need is you will get love if you just have the right step. Isn't sorry. Yeah. I'm that's the, that's it. That's the that's just an yeah, go ahead. Isn't this already a little bit the case? I mean I I would a little bit. make it <laughs> <laughs> it's already quite a bit the case. Yeah, so well, okay, I'm thinking of like multiple things. So like yeah. one thing is I'm thinking of like uh like the phenomena of young girls selling their virginities yeah. online for like millions of, or billions of dollars yeah. into like I don't know, like Saudi princes or whatever. Yeah. Or um, seeking arrangement, yeah. which I'm so tempted to do because, like, why, why the hell would you not? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you don't even have to have sex with them. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, like, it, anyway. It's a, it's a near virginity, so I'm giving you a cut rate price on it. But like about the idea of like having to like have a certain like financial stability or liberty to like have at least like safe good sex, like thinking about like. Um, being able to afford um, contraception or yeah. like, any sort of like yeah. medical care that might go yeah. along with being sexually active, yeah. or like literally when you're talking about like Laban's or like yeah. having a space, yeah. a private intimate space, yeah. to, like do sexual things. Like you can't have that if yeah. you know you live with your eight brothers and sisters in a very small yeah. apartment, you know, in a poor yeah. part of town or something yeah. like that. And so it feels like in some ways, at least in ways that might not be obvious to. Yeah. Society at large, but like some people are already feeling that. Like, oh no, I'm, I think we could start off just this way. So take um, the engagement, the engagement ring, the yeah. wedding, the wedding dress. These are big ticket items. And you think that's you? like a dowry almost. Hmm? It's, it's like a reverse dowry of like what people yeah. say like over like buying or like exchanging like monetary goods as much, but like the woman paying for the wedding or yeah. like the man paying for the ring or whatever. Like, well, it's, uh, I mean, I think it's the thought of it wouldn't be a marriage. It wouldn't be a desirable kind of marriage. It wouldn't be a romantic marriage if it didn't involve these elements, um, including, a, you know, a, a trip, a honeymoon trip. But if you look at what a, 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 a couple get, the debt they get into by getting married, or look what an average, an average, an average American wedding costs. And uh, you can Google it and find out. Sack number, uh, you realize that uh, romance is a big ticket item. Yeah, so that's another way to sort of think about it. Now, the, the reason to just say this, just to, we can easily lose track, uh, so let's back up again and say that <coughs> so when we look at our romantic relationships, right, these personal things that are private, intimate, but occur in intimate spaces. We always want to be aware of the larger political space that surrounds them and the larger economic, natural world that surrounds them too. Because the membranes that we create to make these uh, spaces are permeable membranes. They're not impermeable. We, we already bring into those spaces a whole, ourselves, a whole set of ideas that are constructed not within them but outside. And we use those, yeah, on the inside. Yeah, yeah I just have, a, this yeah. has been bothering me since okay. we started talking about sort of like the yeah. intimate sphere in yeah. general. I mean, those boundaries are political. Yeah. The, yeah. the, jur yeah. the jurisdictional boundaries yeah. between yeah. the personal and the yeah. public are yeah. political. Absolutely. Like. Absolutely. When uh, the two guys who were having homosexual sex in their bedroom and the, and the police uh, broke in mm -hmm. and uh, realized that Although sodomy laws were still, you know, were on the books, they were never enforced. But now suddenly they become uh, utilizable. 
and I think what you recognize is that if the police don't protect you of those spaces or the government doesn't protect them, then they become unavailable. It's very difficult to create in a totalitarian regime an intimate space. All intimate communication is suspect. Right? Privacy is dang politically dangerous. That's why half people get together and what do they do? They plot to overthrow the government. So mm -hmm. that's not how it is. So the lives of others, mm -hmm. that uh, East German film that I mentioned, right, shows what this is like when in fact your entire apartment is bugged. Right? The, the government is watching you, no matter what you're doing. Right? And uh, then you don't have that. Uh, you don't have that freedom. Are we already like Hmm? I literally, as I was biking to school this morning, I thought, we're already wired. Like, this is East Germany. Like, like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually it's probably, it's probably, that yeah. was very primitive compared to what we can do now. And, and like, <laughs> I mean, a satellite could watch it. Someone was just, I mean, you think about yeah. like, like the Black Mirror episodes, like, yeah. everybody has a like, little tape now on yeah. their laptop and yeah. stuff like that. I just feel like we are. Uh, well, That's what's, a little conspiracy, yeah. but like well, yeah. their technology exists to listen to us like all the time. Well, their technology—I mean, their technologies themselves are a very interesting example of the, the two-edged sword. On the one hand, they facilitate communication; on the other hand, they limit yeah. uh, or, or put you at risk in terms of privacy. Uh, so the ease with which we can take electronic photographs, which is great, right? right? You can take them on your cell phone, right? Uh, then you send them, you transmit them. You're not really sure exactly where they're going to end up. You, you know, you send your lover a little photograph of your naughty bits to turn them on or her on. What happens? Next thing you know, it's on the web, right? Uh, that's part of what we're trying to work out with the hearings that are going on about Facebook, mm -hmm. is we're thinking about ways in which we can have the benefits while not being exposed to quite so many of the risks. Right, so, I mean, think, uh, here's a great example, right? So, um, really, uh, as soon as there was uh, fairly promiscuous sex, there was the worry about sexually transmitted diseases. Viruses became a really serious problem, right? Uh, that's what happens when you have uh, free communication. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say sort of like, I mean, a third party in all of your intimate yeah. communication now is a company. Or yeah. like, unless it's face to face, right? Yeah. So you're, I mean, like, Apple and Verizon store all yeah. of your text messages. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, like, Mark Zuckerberg during his hearing yesterday wouldn't directly yeah. answer this question, yeah. but I mean, they're all stored somewhere. For well, uh, absolutely. And I think that, and then you become, um, in this sense, you're giving hostages to fortune. So, in the same way, with your lover, you give a hostage to fortune, right? So you um, reveal all kinds of things uh, to an intimate. And uh, that intimate is now a repository of your secrets. And if uh, stuff goes wrong, there can be a kind of revenge. In fact, there's revenge porn, as you know, right? Um, in which intimate photographs and so on that you've taken together for each other uh, now become something that can be used to slut shame you or do something else, right? So, but you won't, those vulnerabilities are not, um, you, can't, uh, you can't get rid of them and, and keep all of the goods that you have. That's part of, so that, notice the two tensions, right? Uh, you, you, you can't just say, oh, we want all that, but we don't want any of the bad part. A company is going to be looking and, and actually trading in your intimate uh, information to better target you uh, with market forces that can now say, you're right for a purchase of a zone. So look, 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 just what you want, right? Yeah. Yes? Um, I think there's a pretty serious worry in saying that you can get, I mean, obviously I don't think anyone who agreed, like said it, really agreed to it by saying like you can get love with enough money. Yeah. Uh, because the thing is, if you buy into the thing you were saying earlier about how like, you know, money is a way to interact with individuals without trusting them, mm -hmm. uh, then like you, put, you must put the trust somewhere. So you put it in the money, the value, like that you trust the value of the money. Um, so that's kind of like reminds me of this picture that Kierkegaard had, mm -hmm. like that is really also unsettling. That like we see, um, you know, we love someone for the picture of something else that's in them. Yeah. So it's not really instead like of little that. images of God, right? right we're, we're little images Money. of the dollar sign, right? So I, I look at you and I see a hundred million dollars, yeah. mm. right? And you look at me, and it, but notice though there 
was a, there, there was a subtle uh, little thing. And the case of the, so the, this played out in the theological realm. You're right to put them together. Um, this played out in the theological realm this way, right? First, it was really good that we were all little images of God, because then we all had equal value, respect. That was very important to the development of democracy. Then there was the next part. It's not good enough. It's not good enough because we're not, we're, I'm me, you're you, this is Kierkegaard. We can't all just, by, you know, be the ideal, be Christians by being the ideal students of Christianity. Uh, we, there's got to be more to it than that. So as we ratchet up the more to it, we've been caught up in a dialectic. We haven't managed to completely work it all out of what it is to be loved for yourself. Now notice uh, somebody who may, says this, yeah, I want to be loved for myself, and I'll tell you what I am. I'm a really good earner. Right? I, what, my, I'm a consumer, man. That's my essence. That's what I really am. And what makes me me is not that I'm uh, uh, not a consumer. It's that I've got these consumer goods and this amount of money and that house on the Riviera. And that's what's really valuable about me. And if you love me, you should love me for that. I don't want to be loved for anything else at all because I don't think there is anything else. I think all of that is just masquerading. Now at that point what's happened is we've sort, it's sort of like a Christian who says, but there is nothing valuable about you except that you're an image of God. So what's your problem? <laughs> right? Get, get on it. Get, get with it. You, you, that's it. I just told you everything you need to know. So get into the Getting to heaven. This is get into making a lot of money. That's what's really attractive in our world. If you've got enough of it, you'll be really attractive, no matter what other traits you've got. And your value can be um, given a real dollar amount. Don't have to, it's not notional, it's real. Well, let's embrace it. We don't want to. Because when you put it out like that, right, it's, you think there's something missing about that. That misses something. Right? And so now you're, you keep trying to press on what is the thing that it misses. And you say, well, that's not being loved for yourself. That's being loved for your money, right? That's not what I want. I could lose all that money. Well, he's got more money than I have. Why don't you love him instead, right? Uh, all those problems just recur, but I'm slightly uh, moved over. So we could be encouraged, just as we were encouraged to think of ourselves as Christians with images of God, we can be encouraged uh, to think of ourselves as little images of our bank accounts, our cons consumer power. And that, you know, consumers is what we essentially are, and consumer power is what's really good about us. And even if we don't fully buy it, that can be a big part of our identity and a big part of how we respond to things. Even if we, if I were to ask you if you thought you were that, you would be inclined to say, no, I'm more than that. Nonetheless, a big part of you is like that. And that's because you, in fact, you grew up in a consumer society. That, right? It doesn't work with everybody. It doesn't have to work with everybody. It's enough of it works with enough. So there are a lot of people, the meaning of whose lives is getting more stuff and having more money and getting wealthy. And uh, they're quite happy, in a sense, to be loved for that. Because that's pretty secure. If you love me for my money, as long as I keep it, uh, I'd be OK. Yeah? Um, I'm just like, thinking about like, the whole like, QBR argument. But, like, yeah. Even if, like, just, um, if it's like money or yeah. the image of God, um, I think there's a problem we have with like these like, type of arguments. If if like we present to someone it's like, oh, you're loving this person because yeah. of this dollar sign or whatever, or because you see God in them. Yeah. I I think part of it is also because it's like very simple, and we don't. I don't think like, these big ticket items like love. Yeah. I think <coughs> for some reason um, this may be wrong, but like for some reason we like think these. We like to think these things are very complex, in a sense. Um, but I, my whole thing is like, why can't it be like 
it doesn't have to be money, but why can't it just be love is just one thing? And then why does it have to be like twenty thousand? Like you know. What I, mean? I think that I think the pro. I mean, you know, I see the the line, and I think the thought is, of, um, think of you know, a society as selecting uh, a set of things that uh, go along with love. Uh, but the, the point, though, is that love rem retains another value, and that value is that it's never completely captured by whatever society selects. So there are, uh, let me try that again, right? So just think of it this way. So think of the Romeo and Juliet story. The whole point is that love is transgressive, has a capacity to transgress, to ex exceed whatever value a society puts on. So, so society says what's important in love is that, uh, is that you should marry uh, someone who's in the same socioeconomic class. <coughs> that, that's what really matters. So you shouldn't marry down, you should marry up, right? or across, or never down. Uh, but our lovers uh, constantly find bonds that uh, for that which that's a poor fit. So think of it now, right? So, right? so same with Kierkegaard, right? The whole thought is this doesn't capture the freedom of the person, right? To uh, think there's more to my being a Christian than this social, uh, you know, sort of identity of the Christian uh, establishes. So we need values. Truth is another one, by the way. Right? Truth is never the same as justified. Truth always exceeds your justificatory resources. Why?